lovely introduction. Um, I think you need to stop sharing, and then I can share. Yes. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Yeah, brilliant. So yeah, thank you so much for the invitation um, to come to visit the Thames Valley Regional Group. It's been a while coming. We've tried to organise it for a little bit of time, and I'm actually sitting in a hotel in London, so I am actually in the Thames Valley. So I'm not quite um, as remote as I would be if I was at home in Stockport. But yeah, thanks again, and thank you for taking the time out of your evenings to come here. And what I'm going to talk about today is uh, something I'm very excited by, which is structural geology, and then also something I'm also very excited by, which is kind of having progressive thoughts about how many of the kind of classic um, disciplines and subdisciplines within geosciences might be applied to um, tackling um, climate warming and, and looking for lower carbon energy sources. So that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. I just want to start by thanking that my co-authors in this talk, who are listed on this cover sheet here, um, because this talk arose from um, a kind of an opinion piece that was published in the Joel Sox Geoscientists um, a couple of years ago now, um, where um, Dave and Jen and Chris and Chris kind of looked at structural geology for a sustainable world. And it was from that that we kind of decided to build this out a little bit more and also do some analysis to look at how geoscience education was also moving towards um, supplying graduates, if you will, who could also contribute to a lower carbon energy future. So I'm going to touch on that towards the end of the talk as well. The important thing is, I always have disclaimers normally at the start of my talks, this is work that's under construction. These are just our rising thoughts as all of us as structural geologists are starting to engage in this either in academia or in industry. Um, and so it's open to, to discussion, it's open to uh, critique, it's open to input from yourselves on the call. So I'd really uh, value that, and we would value that in the at the end of the at the end of this at the end of the talk. So what is net zero? You know, doesn't need much introduction, perhaps. Um, the role of anthropogenic greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, and a number of other gases which are causing climate warming. Um, net zero, the aim of which is to limit global temperature rise to one and a half degrees by 2100. Now, there's a number of different um, targets, and um, whether we limit warming to 1.5 degrees, or we limit global warming to two degrees, and each of those have their own um, period over which we need to try and achieve net zero for carbon dioxide and net zero for all greenhouse gases. So we often talk about carbon dioxide because it's one of the major contributors and we, it's one of the major emissions, but there are other greenhouse gases to consider. There's a number of different ways of reaching that as shown in this graph uh, at the bottom here through time. If we want to get down to this like negative em emissions and get below two degrees, we not only need to decarbonize our energy sources, but we also in green at the bottom here need to um, be actively involved in removing carbon dioxide, anthropogenic generated carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and storing it as well. So I'm gonna talk about both of those things, right? Both the energy bits, and also the storage bit, because structural geology has a really important role in, in both of those. So that's net zero. What is structural geology? And I think most people on the call will know what this is, but I think I'll just give you a refresher. It's looking at rock deformation across many scales from all, you know, all the way down to the crystal scale of deformation, all the way up to the formation of giant folds and fractures that deform the Earth's crust. Um, the scope and applications of which are many and varied, you know, we go all the way from fundamental understanding of stress, so thinking about uh, things which used to give me nightmares at university like Moore circles, where we think about the kind of fundamental rock mechanics, and then how those rock mechanics can be applied to understanding, in this case, constructing a tunnel. This is Ledar's tunnel in Norway, the longest road tunnel in the world, and on the right hand side is um, a landslip caused due to instability. Um, so we, we, we look at the way that rocks become stressed and how we can engineer them and how we can predict and perhaps mitigate for damage like the top right image. More generally as well, from, you know, blue skies, if you will, we can understand the deformation of rocks within the earth and the formation of mountain belts and all the spectacular geomorphology. And then we can take all of that knowledge, the stress and the strain understanding into looking at resources. So in this particular case I'm showing here is oil and gas, but this could all equally apply to water or some of the other things I'm going to talk about later on. So we, we have this very fundamental stress strain kind of background, and then we can go and look at um, ways of applying that knowledge. Now, obviously, net zero and structural geology are, are inextricably related. 
because structural geology has historically been a, a, a major contributor or it's been used uh, for hydrocarbon exploration production. And we see that here, okay, so 1910 through to 2030, this is the peak oil curve in here. We see conventional hydrocarbon exploration increasing during the first half of the last century. We then see decrease slightly later than predicted by the peak oil curve. But then we had the so-called fracking revolution where in this particular case, an understanding that low permeability rocks could be fractured and therefore liberate the gas that they contained. You know, we realized there was geology that was 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 suitable for doing that. And we came up with mechanisms to, to do that. We saw this increase again in the in the overall production. Now, structural geology clearly contributed to that, right? You know, we, 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 we use that structural geology understanding to define traps. We used it to understand how to um, to deform rocks and liberate the hydrocarbons from within them. Clearly, the issue there is then, you know, as we were producing more fossil fuels, there was this increase in CO2 emissions. This is CO2 emissions from the burning of fossil fuels and cement production. But overall, even if you take away the cement production, there is this, this overall rise in CO2 emissions, which inevitably then leads to or led to this. What you're seeing here are animations from a number of different scientific research institutes showing the global temperature anomaly. So essentially global warming in the post-industrial times. So, you know, I think we can hold our hands up and say structural geology is amazing, whether it's the fundamental stuff or the application, in some way it's played a role in, 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 in the climate warming. Clearly looking forward though, there are other ways of considering how geosciences can, can, can kind of tackle climate warming and actually still do a bunch of other stuff which helps us in a societal and environmental sense. And this is captured in this hopefully very well known and, uh, and, uh, and, and kind of a very inspiring Geological Society of London and Geology for Global Development poster, which shows a number of different ways in which geosciences can uh, benefit us. So, you know, I'm going to talk today about this over here, renewable energy or lower carbon energy in here. But equally, we need geologists as well to understand um, geohazards. So like volcanoes, how do we mitigate, you know, as we get cities that expand as our urban centres grow, we're going to come into contact with more hazards. And so having geoscientists to understand rock deformation and earthquake uh, geology is going to be important. So there's a range of different ways geology across the piece is going to be important to achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals, but structural geology as well. If we focus in now on the energy transition itself, there's a number of different ways in which we're going to be looking at the Earth's subsurface. We're going to be looking at it in three key ways. Waste. So we're going to be putting stuff in the ground, right? Blue, the blue arrows are just, we're going to be putting things in the ground. Radioactive waste and CO2 storage are two of the ones I'm going to touch on today. Energy storage. Now, this is an interesting one because this is where we're putting things into the ground and taking it back out. So hydrogen is one of those things I'm going to talk about. What's interesting with energy storage is that you've then got this kind of interesting short term relationship between stress and strain where you're, you know, in, in the hydrogen case, you're putting hydrogen into a salt cabin, let's say, you're stressing those wall rocks, you maybe have those wall rocks becoming strained, and some of that strain is irrecoverable. So the rocks are permanently damaged, therefore, you fundamentally change the physical properties of the rock hosting that particular energy store. And then you, 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 you kind of take that out and, and it's and then you have to re you have to reinflate or you then put a hydrogen back into that cavern or compressed air. Um, the thermomechanical coupling with that deformation is, is, is kind of all new stuff. The, the time period over which that's happening, so it's going to be maybe seasonal uh, to, fill, to fill in energy gaps from other sources. So there's a lot of new kind of things to be thought about when we're kind of cycling materials in and out of the earth. And then energy extraction, some of which are ultimately familiar to as coal and oil and gas on the left hand side here, but things like geother geothermal fluids as well, where geothermal actually kind of sits partly between energy storage and energy extraction in that we are putting water down into the earth and bringing it back up. And I'll come, I'll talk a bit about that as well. So you can see there's a number of different ways in which we're going to be engineering the subsurface of the earth and it's going to require structural geology understanding and it's going to happen at a number of different structural depths all the way from landfill down to some deeper um, sort of um, endeavours. 
So let's start off by looking at geothermal energy. And whenever we see geothermal energy, well, like if you Google geothermal energy, there's lots of pretty cartoons like this come up. And they're kind of useful because it's a way of telling people that the earth is hot, right? As we go down due to the geothermal gradient, our planet warms. Therefore, if we put water down there, we can warm it up, bring it back up. And in this case, in a high temperature geothermal system, we can create power by driving a turbine. The kind of problem with these sorts of diagrams, they show the Earth is really kind of straightforward and, and layered, right? There's no faults, no fold, and relatively heterogeneous layers, in this case here, where the cold water just flows along to where we're extracting the hot water. So we know that the Earth isn't like that, it's more like this. It's heterogeneous in terms of the lithologies that are present. They, it is heterogeneous structurally because the permeability is varied as a function of the presence of normal faults as well, as you can see in here. So, you know, when we're, when we're thinking about putting in cold water and getting out hot water, we need to be much more mindful about the structural geology that we may encounter when we're trying to develop these particular energy resources. And we need to think about that, not just simply in terms of deep geothermal, so where we're accessing Earth-derived heat from radioactive decay, going down into the Grinsic intrusions like we're doing in Cornwall, but even at relatively shallow depths, if we look at things like mine water energy, which I'll, I'll talk about briefly, um, we need to be we need to be aware of the structural geology we're gonna we're gonna encounter. We see that again with this um, when we look at uh, um, abandoned coal mine, uh, relatively low temperature heating systems. We have a lot of stratigraphic heterogeneity imposed by the depositional system, in this case, in the Carboniferous, where we have the coal seams, which have been exploited. That's where we want to flush our water through here to heat it up and then to bring it back up. Um, but locally, because of the nature of the UK geology, you know, those, those coal mines were also faulted as a function of rifting. Um, so we also have this additional structural heterogeneity on top of the inherent stratigraphic heterogeneity. You know, we want nice open workings where we can flush fluid through, we can have a very predictable, predictable um, hydrology. And in fact, what we may encounter is deformed rocks which have variable permeability, which could either be cemented up and actually impede um, the flushing of fluids, which means that we might not be able to access the kind of all of the heat we model to be present within a certain volume of rock, because we're not actually encountering all of that heat with the, with the production water or we end up in a situation where some of these fault zones actually have higher permeability. So we actually have lower pressure in the production borehole because the faults are actually higher permeability vertically than actually the layers of rock which they might be flowing in. Um, so we get kind of almost what we used to call in reservoir modeling thief zones. The faults could actually be stealing the, the, the water which isn't as warm as we'd wish it to be at that point in time. So, you know, actually having good structural geology models for, for these sorts of settings is going to be really important. If we think about deeper geothermal energy here, so hotter stuff for power, and in the UK at the moment, we've got really one sort of set of geology, which is really, um, which is really um, got potential on a, on a significant scale there. I mean, other parts of the world are much better, for example. But, you know, when we're pu putting things down, in this case, to several kilometres uh, depth, um, you know, and, and we're trying to utilize damaged rock, which has higher permeability, meaning we have better connectivity between our cold water in the injection well and our hot water coming out of the production well. We need to understand both the geometry of those normal fault zones, but also the hydraulic connectivity of those fracture networks. Because, you know, we may not have enough boreholes or seismic reflection data to characterize them, and we may be requiring the use, as I'm showing here from the Taupo volcanic zone, magneto uh, telluric surveys. And these are these are interesting because you get this beautiful kind of blurry pattern of, in this case, of, of, of you know the readings from from the subsurface here, but in terms of the magnetic properties of the rocks, but you need a structural geologist really to make sense of these blobs because otherwise they're blobs in space. And what you really want to do is have a structural model within which your remote sensing data or your geophysical data can be interpreted. So there's, there's that context that's required from a geologist point of view on top of these um, more technologically driven exploration methods. At a much smaller scale from like the exploration scale things I'm showing at the top here is when we're going into the production when 
realm where we're trying to think about connectivity between different borehole pairs, and that comes from fraction analysis of FMIs, so formation microimaging um, tools, and also core data as well. So do we have the capacity to actually map and measure and characterize those fractures in terms of their hydraulic properties? Are they open? Are they closed? Also taking that static structural geology information, that strain data and understanding it in the context of the present day stress field, because the present day stress field may actually dictate whether faulted rock or which bits of faulted rock are actually gonna be um, permeable for the fluids that we wish to introduce and, and, and produce. So that's again, back to the original slides, that relationship between stress and strain in the present day, um, kind of conditions is, is going to be really important. So these are all techniques that structural geologists have at their fingertips, and they have an inherent understanding of these things. And it's going to be interesting to see how they get applied to uh, geothermal energy, if not just in the UK, but globally, of course. Just sticking with the, the Porth um, Tauwin fault zone, so down in Cornwall again, and, and this high temperature geothermal area, there's, you know, interesting work being done here around the co-production of um, precious minerals and metals as well. So not simply exploiting the heat um, for geothermal energy, but also producing the metals that are brought up within that water. Um, in, and lithium is one of those things that's been, been talked about down there. And in fact, some of the kind of very you know, in the latest test, there's been some very promising results in terms of lithium content of the produced water. What's interesting here is then not simply then just the structural geology in terms of the production of the geothermal um, field, it's actually then going and looking at where these minerals may be enriched within this fault zone, because that then requires a much longer term understanding or needs you to take a, a much longer term view of the whole geology of the region. So why are there these particular fluids present that have deposited these particular minerals and where may they be enriched within this geothermal field because that may allow us to then optimize um, production and that's going to require discussion between what we used to call them I'm not sure if we call them anymore but economic geologists so um, mining geologists and also structural geologists working together in concert just like they did decades before remember this was this is just Kind of bringing the band back together, if you will, um, but with a different a different focus. So moving on to something that I've um, worked a, a fair bit on recently is, is the structural geology of, of, of radioactive waste. So um, Jacobs are involved in this. They've been doing a number of ongoing product projects, and um, you know I and you hopefully, um, but not my mum, when I asked her this actually, when I told her I was giving this talk, I said, what's your view about nuclear waste? And she said, oh, they just put it in the ground in a cave. Um, and it's and like a cartoon and it's not quite like that, but it's actually not that far away from the, the, the thing on the left hand side, you know, there's stuff in barrels sitting in trenches or in some sort of chambers. And we need, um, you know, the, the, the argument is, is we need a, a much safer and longer term storage solution for this legacy waste and this is legacy waste arising from um, weapons testing, legacy waste arising from medical use as well. And the proposed solution is to have this so-called GDF, so geological disposal facility. This is where we would engineer a containment system, which has both um, human made and uh, natural rock barriers, which then we could put down at, you know, maybe about a kilometer depth beneath the Earth's surface, and then um, keep the radioactive waste away from an active hydrological system, which may actually facilitate the leakage of that material back up to the Earth's surface. And we have certain regulatory constraints on, on, on the kind of environmental safety case of so how long um, we need to be able to kind of keep that, that, that waste away from, from, from the water table and from, and from people. And again, you know, this, 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 this cross section here makes the Earth's surface look really simple. There's a bunch of layers, we're just going to stick this thing in and it should be fine. But in reality, some of the sites we're looking at are geologically more complicated than that. One of the older sites, and this is from Sellafield, which now is no longer going to be the, the, the site of choice. But you can see with this cross section through um, Sellafield, geologically, how complicated it was. So you had a number of different rock types in here. So you went all the way from the Borrowdale Volcanic group, so Ingenium Brights and, and very low permeability rocks, which was sort of the target for the repository. But then it's overlain by a number of other kind of very variable rock types going from carboniferous limestone through to 
um, Triassic um, sandstones as well and clastics faulted to death. So structurally very, very complicated. Now, some of the sites that are going to be looked at now, and I'm going to come on to that in a moment, have possibly not exactly the same structural geology challenges as Sellafield had, but they are similar and um, bits of data we're going to have to use to, for the site characterization, seismic data, borehole data, potential field data, so gravity and magnetic data as well. Structural geologists are needed here clearly then to actually again look at borehole data, characterize the rock mass, looking at faults, looking at these uh, wonderfully open uh, fractures in here, these um, fracture filling cements, which are kind of very, very voggy. We need structural geologists as well to look at cement phases within uh, cathodoluminescence data in this particular case, um, to look at generations of uh, cements and what that might tell us about the seismic history of um, these regions. Also, uranium lead dating and various other dating mechanism, methods of, of, of fault cements, because one concern here is obviously around the seismic hazard from, from fault. So PSHE, probabilistic seismic hazard analysis, requires us to have an idea of what the capable faults are. So where are the faults? How big are they? When were they last active? Could they be active within the, life, um, the lifespan of, of this facility? So that requires, again, an understanding of earthquake geology and structural geology. And from that, you know, we can build these, these models. And this is something I've been working on is thinking about the structural geology of these sites and then how then we can use those to make hydrogeological models um, to understand how water may interact with um, an engineered facility. Like I said, there's a number of different sites that have been proposed. Um, you know, Cumbria has been revisited. Um, uh, in Copeland, uh, in Allerdale, there's also um, a site in Lincolnshire as well. Um, these are kind of interesting in that they're quite substantially different geologies. So in Cumbria, it's likely to be the Mercy Mudstone group. So a, um, a mudstone which is uh, non-marine, but also contains quite complicated um, evaporitic layers, which mechanically are quite different. I'll talk about that in a second. Whereas Lincolnshire is likely to be the early Jurassic mudstones. So again, depositionally very different rock types and, and also very different to what Sellafield was before. These are low, what we call low strength sedimentary rocks rather than the high strength sedimentary rocks in the Borodale volcanic case from, from Sellafield or the Cumbrian example. So the rock deformation properties of those, the deformation properties of those rocks is very different to what we've dealt with before. Because if we look here at the Mercy Mudstone group in, in, in exposed in the field, we see these, um, these nice red um, bedded mudstones, but these whitish layers here are gypsums, which have been rehydrated from anhydrite. So, um, so in the subsurface, it's likely to be anhydrite. There may be halites as well in there. These rocks are going to behave very differently to the, the imposed, or they're going to be, behave very differently to imposed stresses, and also the thermomechanical coupling is of interest because there's heat generated by the radioactive waste, which means that the properties in the field or even the properties here on the right hand side, you know, when we're doing rock deformation um, say triaxial tests on these mudstone samples, it might be very different to the um, conditions encountered at one to one and a half, say, kilometers depth in the earth. So it's taking us into new fields of structural geology and, and having to revisit Having spoken to some people about this as well, I was kind of shocked as well by the lack of kind of characterization of these particular rock types. I thought lots had been done on, in this case, the Mercy Mudstone group, but it's amazing how sparse the core material is to actually take a piece of that core material and actually do a rock deformation test on it. And then look at, let's say, the water and gas transport properties of these low permeability materials. Um, so there's lots of exciting science to be done, lots of exciting structural geology to be done with a real purpose, which is characterizing these, these geologically very variable sites for radioactive waste storage. And then kind of, you know, finally moving on to like one of the, the, the other kind of technical um, cases is carbon dioxide storage. Again, we're gonna be putting stuff in the ground and hoping to keep it there. And again, we're gonna be doing that in, basins which have very variable geology we're going to be you know some people would wish to store carbon dioxide in anticlines some people would wish to store supercritical co2 in synclines because you know you can have sluggish movement of those away from these 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 synclinal axes 
some people might want to use look at storing co2 within you know different sandstone types and be concerned about the reactivity so there's lots of kind of questions kind of quite fundamental questions about what are the best locations for storing carbon dioxide because it's not simply a case of reverse engineering oil and gas production there's other interactions or other um there's other what's the word i'm looking for there's other processes occurring and reactions that occur between you know saline water and carbon dioxide that are very different to to what we've encountered before and again thinking about how introducing that fluid in its various states into the earth's subsurface may actually then cause damage to the rocks or stress the rocks as we start to increase pore pressures as we're as we're putting more things into the ground or you know maybe that's not a concern because the pore pressures are not going to increase so much but you know that pore pressure stress strain coupling is important from a co2 storage point of view on the right hand side is again something at jacobs we've started looking at which is hydrogen storage so thinking about ways in which we would engineer the earth to um to store that and compressed air one potential target is within evaporitic rocks which have low permeabilities um, and this is a well-established technique on in for example the gulf coast of the us and there's opportunities there in the uk with with salt layers which are present um, onshore and uh, not necessarily within diaperic structures but within layered bedded evaporitic sequences but offshore certainly there's also opportunities maybe in the shallow water and the so-called inshore domain in diapers, which have grown from, in that case, the, the Zechstein um, Lepingian evaporites. You know, again, putting material into the ground and taking it back out may actually damage these rocks, or they may not, because some of these rocks may actually, the, the creep processes, which are one of the main rock deformation mechanisms for these, these, um, these these types of rocks maybe 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 the fractures would heal maybe the fractures won't propagate that far away from the cavern these are all questions which need to be answered um there's also some interesting complexities on shore in the uk where we have bedded salt rather than pure diaperic halite rich salt where we have more heterogeneous salt which may contain on hydrides and other rock bodies and, and mudstones is that those rocks will obviously deform very differently. So some rocks will deform um, in a brittle sense and some will maybe deform in a more ductile sense. So the damage to those rocks and the way the permeability may evolve when we're cycling over a few decades may be quite different for those different rock layers. So characterizing the thickness and extent and the rock deformation properties of those rock layers is going to be, is going to be critical for, for basically doing this sort of production safely. So kind of like zooming out from some of those technical details, you know, what's the future of this of structural geology? Well, you know, it's global. We're here in the Thames Valley, but actually, you know, many of you perhaps are working for companies who have interests on the other side of the world. That's certainly the case for Jacobs. You know, critical metals mining is going to be happening in a number of different places, as is CO2 storage, looking at these, these different basins that, that may be uh, suitable for, for large amounts of CO2 to be stored. So they're still like really... Kind of exciting global opportunities so lots of ways for structural geologists to get their hands dirty in different parts of the world and, and you know i've kind of talked about this before with people and sometimes there's a bit of fear that the geology is not going to be as exciting in this lower carbon energy future but when i look at this map and i think about the basins that are present here i can't believe that's true one thing that is going to be of interest though is what is going to be the kind of volume of geoscientists that's required to actually deliver this lower carbon energy future not just structural geology but just geoscientists more generally and i've talked to rick fritz here ex-president of apg a bit about this with spe who did some work around geoscience and and energy transition related careers looking at the number of jobs that were advertised looking at pay and looking at a number of different things it was a very us focused analysis um admittedly um but what was kind of interesting from that work was there's lots of skills that geologists already have and structural geologists have that could be readily transferred with some upskilling and some reskilling um, to tackle some of the things I've just talked about in the last few slides. But what was kind of worrying slightly is that the, it looks like there'll be less people needed, or at least there's less people needed now. And some people would predict that the volume, the scale of these particular sectors even when they're starting to scale and the government stimulus comes in and, and there's more and more 
um, you know, costs come down, the, the, the businesses get larger, there's not going to be as many people needed. And that's obviously a concern, right? That's what I read on LinkedIn. Lots of people um, screaming and shouting about how, um, you know, people are going to be out of work. And that's a that's an absolutely justifiable concern on employment, especially now. So there is there is that concern. So it's, it's useful to be mindful of that. I mean, Matt Hall, who's just, I think, started working for Equinor now, I had a discussion with him once about this, and he kind of made a really interesting point and said, why does anybody think that the lower carbon energy um, future might need as many geologists as the kind of fossil fuel based um, in energy kind of future needed. So it was kind of interesting that there was no, like when that started and grew, there was never a number people were aiming for. It was just that's how many people were needed to deliver this thing. So yeah, we'll see what happens. Kind of like the last few slides I've got here are really talking about, you know, like more general issues, you know, are we who we need to be to kind of deliver this this lower carbon energy future and this is not now focusing solely on structural geology we have as you know a big issue around gender diversity um in geosciences i've done some work in that for, for in other in other bits of my life and this was some data from from tsg uh, 2021 um and you know this cartoon on the right is simply to point out that we now have this language of intersectionality where we all come with these very complicated identities and it's important to think about how those identities cross cut with each other to make sure that we are as welcoming and as inclusive as possible in the jobs we do and also therefore we're as trained and as prepared as possible to take structural geology to all of these different parts of the world right so that cultural understanding is really critical to make sure that the science that we care so deeply about is actually being applied in an appropriate way, because what we don't want to do is do recolonization science where we just go and impose things on people. I think we can do things better in this lower carbon energy future. There's a number of different groups obviously advocating for this. The Thames Valley Group will be aware of some of these, so Black and Geosciences, Geosciences of the Future, Pride and STEM, a number of different um, groups who are working very hard to um you know not only diversify the, the the body of workers in these different fields but also making these fields much more inclusive and therefore we don't just want to increase diversity if we do nothing to increase retention rates as well because this retention rates are obviously are kind of very gendered and very and and very they they kind of race and ethnically wise they're, they're quite different as well so we we need groups like this to have the conversations alongside all the technical work we're, we're doing thinking a bit more are we appropriately preparing you know the next generation who are going to come forward and and probably you know and well actually not probably absolutely you know the graduates that i used to work with in the master's course at imperial college you know they were they wanted to do different things and they were getting different jobs you know, so historically, this is what we do stress, strain, <laughs> application, right? So there'd be some, and for me, I just hated more circles. So there was this quite like abstract thing I was trying to learn. And then suddenly it came to strain, and I got back. So I could go in the field with my compass Kleiner, I could measure something. And then somebody said these rocks are deformed because of the stress. So I kind of went back to the stress theory and I sort of understood it a bit more. And then the applications thing. But why not like actually start to repackage how we teach people? Let's go to the application. Let's start off structural geology uh, 101 uh, and say to people why do we need structural geology well we might need it to produce geothermal energy which you know is much more a common language i think for some incoming graduates and then take them through all of the skills they need to actually understand how to explore for and produce those particular resources so then take them back through stress and strain ideas because then the motivation for it is clear So staying with that idea of you know who's coming in to to kind of drive the future in this area you know we have these issues to do with um attracting students at the moment so a level geology intake this graph apparently from when i was at the earth science teachers association meeting i think it's kind of bottomed out now around about a thousand it kind of came up a bit so it's actually lower than is shown here it's around about a thousand geology students from a high in the 80s of 4,000 and even recent high of two and a half thousand. So we've actually seen this big decrease. That also goes through into, um, you know, students who are going, you know, who are coming in and, and, and maybe thinking about jobs in the oil industry, you know, this green dashed line is showing that. 
you know, I'm, I'm never convinced that they track, but I think some of you on the call will probably tell me otherwise, you know, this boom and bust cycling of the oil price does drive periods of hiring and firing within the oil sector. And, you know, incoming graduates are, are aware of that, certainly in the conversations I've had with them in the first year, let alone masters. And it's, and it's, a, and it's been discussed, right? Geoscience is on the chopping block, uh, Joel Sock in just, two miles away from where I'm sitting here, may have to move out of its home. It's the oldest learned society in the in the world and it, and it might have to move because of declining membership numbers. And so we have a real challenge on our hands to make geoscience really relevant, which I think is really important when we're talking to graduates or, or prospective graduates, A-level students, GCSE students, about the fact that geosciences can be deployed in all of these really important and super interesting geological challenges we have for our lower carbon energy future. Just to kind of come through to the master's level, having looked a bit at A-level there. So this is some work I did with Jen and, and others of looking at the number of student projects. So we went to a number of different master's courses, including Manchester Imperial, where I used to work, and looked at the student projects in the summer where they do that three month project to see what, what they were doing it on, you know, and these are all broadly petroleum or resource focused masters. And you saw that over time, there was a decrease in the number of student projects from 2017 to 2021. And that was because there was overall declining number of students on those courses. So, you know, Imperial College's MSc uh, is, is now closed. Um, what was really interesting is this next graph, which looked at what the projects were on. So we went and asked the course directors and we got the lists of all the projects that were offered during those different years. And you saw that there was almost, you know, like 90 plus percent of hydrocarbon focused projects back in 2017. And in only four years, that had decreased to around about, you know, 60 degree, uh, 60 percent or, or so. There was this big climb in sustainable projects. So these were everything from wind farm sightings, carbon dioxide sites, uh, carbon dioxide storage site characterization, nuclear waste storage um, as well. And um, there were people doing things around geohazards as well for subsea infrastructure. And so th there's an increase. And what I found kind of interesting here is a lot of that was being driven by students wanting that change, right? So they were coming in saying, I want to do this project in this particular area because I think it's going to be attractive for these employers. Now, you know, you can say whether that's right or wrong. That's what they wanted to do. If we think about that then, you know, what the student desires are and what the courses are, there's a number of like motivators and barriers to that change in the types of projects students are doing, you know, the motivators, students want to do those projects and the shifts in research funding, I certainly felt this towards projects more in that area, it was almost impossible to get money for oil and gas research, at least from the government, you could get it still from, from um, energy companies, but the shifts in research funding meant we were more looking towards doing student projects in those areas. What some of the barriers are staff capacity. If you don't have the staff working in those areas, it's hard to provide those sorts of projects for students. And also we're slightly or worse, slightly limited by the accreditation process by these bodies on the right hand side, where there was a requirement to teach a certain thing and not another thing. So it's a bit like Ofsted coming in and telling you all what the national curriculum is at schools, right? You've got to do these things, which makes it hard to do these other things, even if people want to do them. So that, that's one of the barriers. Things that are mixed are industry interest, you know, how much the industry want us to do those things, resources and support. Did we have data to run those sorts of projects? Did we have support from um, companies as well? And um, so that relates to the industry interest. And then also the job market as well, you know, are there enough jobs in there to train people in these things? Or is oil and gas still the rage we need to keep, keep getting, giving them projects in that area as well? And finally, we saw that as well at TSG, because this, you know, this work originally arose from some work we, that Jen and others did for TSG. I'm not going to go through it in detail. This just shows that from the 90s and noughties, where there was a very much a focus on the application of structural geology to um, hydrocarbon exploration production. By the time you came through to the TSG this year that I spoke at, um, it was much more focused on sustainability. And I think it's interesting, I don't know if you remember or you've heard, but, you know, for the JOLSOC or the old um, Northwest Europe conference, it used to be called held at the Barbican. Now I think it's been held in Aberdeen. You know, they, were, they opened up the abstracts for, for oil and gas again, because there was a comment made, by, I think, by Graham Goffey saying, we haven't had that many abstracts about oil and gas, so we'd like some more. Um, 
And Mike Simmons as well wrote a piece about, you know, the lack of oil and gas abstracts in a recent energy transition conference. So there's, there's clearly kind of things in the water, if you will, around structural geology and, and, and you know, and, and the application to whether it's hydrocarbons or, or these other things we've talked about tonight. Um, yeah, just a last, uh, last slide, really, you know, field geology, you know, we love field geology, uh, structural geology, especially there's people just say it's really important. But actually, if you go and read the literature, it's it, it tells a different story, both from the educator side and from the student side, 37% of students in this particular example here said bedrock mapping should be the focus of field courses, they think there should be lots of other stuff. You know, there's comments that it's possible to become an expert without field work and, you know, the changing needs of graduates and employees suggest current training is not effective. And these are words that came partly, at least, from this JOLSOC um, survey of employers, which said, what do you want from people? And, you know, ArcGIS and programming and things like that were becoming increasingly important alongside um, what we have as classic kind of structural geology and fieldwork and mapping, you can see down in here. So just to summarise and provide an outlook, you know, structural geology, you know, started off under viable links to the ongoing climate crisis, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying that, you know, but, you know, let's look forward, we have this really critical role to play in the low carbon energy future. We need to kind of keep engaging with policymakers and, and try and make um, geosciences um, as diverse and inclusive as possible, because with that we will have the breadth of um, ideas and breadth of thought that's required to kind of come up with um, solutions to some of these challenges. So we're not just applying the old methods to these new arising challenges. And, you know, thinking about teaching as well, you know, the future teaching should be framed more explicitly around these, these topics I've covered tonight, because I think it's a really exciting, engaging way to get people to come and study geosciences. And then with that, once you've captured them with that, you can then teach them about stress and strain theory. Um, but yeah, it's a really, it's a really uh, exciting future we have there. So uh, thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Chris, for that. Can you hear me? Yeah, I've got you. Yeah. Yes, uh, that's that was a very thought-provoking talk. Uh, definitely um, addressing a lot of current issues. Um, there is a question from uh, Angela. She oh, says, yeah. uh, there seems to be a lot of maybes when you were talking about storage in salt caverns, and yet you mentioned this was being used in the Gulf. So how have they resolved some of these uncertainties or haven't they? Yeah, so the maybes were largely referring to not the technicality of doing the geology and the engineering. It was more to do with whether it would be stimulated by you know, the government. So will there be a, a hydrogen storage industry? Will it scale? Will there be lots of, you know, how, how widespread will that be? What geology will that encounter? So I think that's more what I was stressing with the maybes. You know, we've got a government at the moment who are on telly every day saying we're going to start drilling tomorrow in the Bolin Shale, right? And fracking. And you know, and then sort of like in the background is our COP26 or our kind of like, you know, commitments to climate change and and things like hydrogen. So I think there's I think there's a bit of confusion at the governmental level, which ultimately will dictate, you know, the, the, the pace and scale of things like hydrogen storage and salt caverns. Because I think from again, from you know, work that's been done in Germany and in the Gulf Coast, I think the geology, I think we I think we can do it. I think there's some things we need to understand better. And the, the British salt geology is different to the Gulf Coast salt geology, of course. You know, they're the large diapyric structures with cap rock, halite rich cores, some uh, inclusions they call them within those salt wells. We're gonna be trying to look at engineering within bedded layers salt, which isn't diapyric, so it's not flat. So there's a different geology um, slightly, but um, yeah, I think I think we can do a lot there. Um, and then uh, Angela said, yeah, the idea of teaching applications before theory, I, I don't quite understand why we don't do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, don't, I really I mean, I struggled with that as well at university, I must say. Yeah. Um, you're faced with so much information uh, without knowing where where to take it. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, yeah. so I think some people have done this, and I, I think it was the people I spoke to at Edinburgh, so Mikhail Attel and um, 
for some of his colleagues and they were kind of saying that for some of their like lower level courses that were their introductory courses they were doing more of that you know they were saying well here's a mountain belt how do we understand when this mountain belt formed and you know how big it is and how stable it is and what hazards they are so you position something at the core of the learning and then you sort of build almost the curriculum knowing where the curriculum is all right because you you sort of know but you build the curriculum with the students because then you say what do you need to know about geochronology what do you need to know about metamorphic geology igneous geology sedimentology to understand this mountain belt so you give them a, a central core and, it, and it's much more a provocation to learn rather than sit here i've written this syllabus out and you're going to sit and listen to it and then we do sort of talk about um prerequisites for certain courses but I still think it's um, I was a terrible student you know unless I could actually see how it worked I, I, I wasn't very interested there's probably people on the call who were better than me but certainly like having that would be really useful um I think as a as a, yeah. as a central device I agree a question here from Ben how do you see the future of pure academic research I think I think there's lots of going on already you know a lot of people are working on deep sea sedimentology and stratigraphy for hydrocarbon exploration reduction is now looking at microplastics they're now looking at um carbon dioxide storage in those sorts of rocks as well so the you know looking at how in this particular case you know injected co2 may react with um, specific mineral types within deep water reservoir deep water rocks and where those specific fine grain mineral types are positioned within levees versus channels or whatever it might be so this you know academics are very good at pivoting towards where there's funding and they're good at reading about things and repositioning themselves to, to, to try and solve some of these problems. So um, yeah, pure academic researchers are, 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 are kind of involved in that um, as well. Another one from Sheila. Uh, yeah, I can read this. So the trends, uh, yeah, yeah, so the B, yeah, so the BGA as well. And BSRG, the British Sedimentological Research Group, if they've not done it already, I think they should, and they may have already done it, but doing a survey and looking at what the kind of needs and desires are of both the employers for sedimentologists in that case, but also the students who are doing sedimentological um, masters and PhD studies. So, um, and I think as well, incoming students, like, I guess it's fair to use the term young in this, like young people are aware of these social and economic challenges and they're aware of some of the historical links that oil and gas industry have had with the climate crisis so i think like talking to them about the fact that geology is more than that and it's like all these other cool mm. things i think is really is really valuable we shouldn't be embarrassed about it but equally i don't think we should either be embarrassed about saying you know fossil fuel based economies have lifted people out of poverty in certain parts of the world right they've they've increased healthcare provision They've increased access to education for women in certain parts of the world. So there's there are there are economies which have grown and have provided opportunities that otherwise wouldn't have been there. And I think we should not be too coy in talking about those things as well. I agree. Geology tends to be vilified these days. Uh, if you mention that you're a geologist, people tend to pounce on you. <laughs> but it's not. But I think this is the thing I still don't really understand right the amount of people getting into the oil and gas industry, even when I finished 20 years ago from my degree, which was from a very fairly applied university, was very small. There were lots of people who went off and did other things. I think the issue more is that the oil and gas industry is more or less exclusively staffed by geologists, right? And it's, you know, it's a fairly big industry. So I think that's the issue is it's not like, I think we just need to tell people that not everybody who goes into it, who becomes a geologist or who became a geologist, in fact, ended up working in the oil and gas industry, but the, the public perception is very much that and it yeah. makes it awkward at dinner parties right because you say you're a geologist and then are, <laughs> but actually i work on you know gear hazards and then suddenly they're a lot nicer to you <laughs> yeah, <yes. laughs> uh, so steve d's got a question it's interesting that there was a lack of conference contributions so yeah so this was uh, i think it was graham i saw him post about it and then also recently there was I think the petroleum group as well were posting about sponsorship and the petroleum group at the Joel Stock now the energy group never historically had a problem getting funding for the big fancy dinner in the Hinsey Hall at the Natural History Museum right it was like caviar mm. and champagne and it was all great um I think it's maybe I don't know maybe there's just less I don't think people are more secretive right I don't think people have less to share 
maybe there's just less it's a more difficult conversation to go and have with your line leader to get the money to go and attend a conference and present about an oil and gas thing when the optics just don't look good because the company I, you know, the company you work for is having a very strong low carbon messaging and you going out and talking about increasing production from this field and so on and so forth or some exploration license is probably not on brand and therefore yes. maybe people are less comfortable going to talk about it. Maybe they themselves are less comfortable talking about it publicly you know they they do it as their day job then there was a study that i posted about on linkedin the other day about this the conflict that some energy industry geoscientists have around this you know i do this thing but i'm very environmentally conscious so people do struggle with that and i think it's good i think i don't think there's any shame in the job they do but i think it's good that they have enough awareness to kind of have that internal dialogue with themselves mm. so i think that might be one reason steve is that you know, it's difficult to attend these sorts of things. I can't believe there's less, I can't believe there's less amazing things to talk about in, in oil and gas <laughs> exploration production, right? That's just not true. That's that's definitely still there. Um, Ian says, yes, for example, field mapping courses can include GIS slope stability assessment. And this came into focus, didn't it, during um, COVID where we were doing um, these um, virtual field trips that you know, we have mapping in our minds as compass kilometer in the rain, feeling sad in a caravan in North Wales, or at least that was my sort of experience of it. But actually mapping, you know, mapping can involve a bunch of different things. It can involve mapping remotely before you go in the field. It can be optimizing mm. sites to visit. It can be building hypotheses in the lab before you go out there and then testing those. So there's lots of ways in which yeah rock stability that we can start to talk about engineering geology then right we can look at landscape yes. and think about the coupling between the the geology which can be over hundreds of millions of years and the and the and the, and the relevant hazard which could you know be instantaneous um yeah so jean-jacques said thanks for talk. how can you see the industry reaching out to getting more people in stem are you being supported yeah i think yeah i think everybody's I think the industry are doing stuff right they sponsor conferences they have a little you know they try well encourage staff to go out and talk to different groups we need to diversify who we go and talk to and um, i get asked every day to go and talk at pretty much every day at fee-paying private schools very rarely from state schools because you know those schools often have the capacity to have somebody kind of whose job it is is to bring in speakers you know so we need to you know jacob's you know really good at doing a lot of work about kind of which schools we go into and how we use um polar and different other socioeconomic metrics to actually target where we go and do this outreach and engagement sort of activity um yeah private companies i think it's just i think it's partly money but it's also time um and then there's also a thing i think there's bits of it you can't get around right if i'm not going to name any companies but if certain companies are involved in questionable activities young people are going to know about it right it doesn't matter then if you send somebody into their school to tell them about a wind farm you know you, it needs to be a joined up way of um getting out as it's written here to more people at the early age yeah steve says the dinner party effect is real also there are less of us with more work cost pressure folks on new energy yeah it's hard right you know this the geology doesn't get any easier when there's less people to do the work <laughs> So you have to do more work and it, and it's more challenging um so yeah but it's you know hopefully you, you know people on the call are still inspired by their, their the jobs they're doing yeah so michael had a question would you have any advice for an early career geologist on how to begin transition to career more involved in search of that and the net zero space yeah so um i've just done this michael obviously i was uh, at imperial for 16 years at manchester for one year I've been an academic for 17 years. Before that, I was at North Hydro Equinor for three years. So I wasn't completely new to the industry space. But I made a conscious decision that not only did I want to leave academia, but I also made a conscious decision that there was quite a lot of inertia scientifically for me to move away from oil and gas and into these other areas that were kind of growing because they just weren't as big. The funding was still tight. It was still, it was still difficult. And that was frustrating. So I thought, why not just go and become a scientist in a company like Jacobs where I get to work on geohazards and seismic hazard problems and and hydrogen storage caverns right why not go and do that so that's what I did the way I did that which is the kind of practical bit of the question here is you know I lit you know for me I actually gave the black history month talk last year to Jacobs at this time last year which is how I got introduced to Jacobs 
but subsequent to that, I saw on LinkedIn, you know, that's where they advertise a lot of um, jobs. You know, you see jobs on LinkedIn all the time. So the practical bit of finding the job, I don't think that's difficult, if you will, because I think companies are quite good at saying we, we've, and you know, and I was talking to some engineering geologists today who said we're struggling to recruit, right? So there seems to be a shortage of people. So, and I just can't believe it, but apparently there is. Yeah. Um, the other bit then, maybe Michael in your question is, is, is like skills. So how would you prepare yourself when you're about to apply? Is there anything you could do in the six months leading up to applying for these types of jobs? You know, reading up, attending meetings, being prepared in the interview to say, okay, I know that CO2 storage is not simply reverse engineering of oil and gas exploration and production, you know, just kind of having that general awareness, because hopefully most companies know that there's not ready on the shelf people who've done a lot of these types of projects. And that's certainly not the case for Jacobs. We're growing our business in terms of number of people to serve clients working in these particular areas. So hopefully then, you know, in those interviews, you'll be able to kind of talk about things you'd like to get into and the skills that you have at the moment that complement what those new arising areas are going to be. First Break have a really good edition. This month came out. I don't know if you, anybody reads First Break from EAGE, but it's about the energy transition. And there's a number of very thought-provoking thought -provoking articles in there about the subtle differences between subsurface geosciences for oil and gas exploration production and even the way you build teams going to steve's point even how teams work because the time scales of oil and gas production are very different for decision making and so on and so forth to a hydrogen storage project right it's much more rapid turnaround the the engagement with the body of rock your engineering is much more rapid so it, yeah, it was it was a yeah yeah Phil Ringrose's piece um, that Sheila's just mentioned in the chat was really really great about how does how do these things differ. So for you, Michael, like kind of upskilling yourself in that awareness, I think is one of the the best things to to do. Um, yeah, so he works for a traditional company. Yeah, I don't know if you're still at were you at, were you at Shell. But yeah, there's companies, you know, the established companies have got BP, <laughs> Steve. Um, you know, the established companies are, 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 are building groups, right? They're building groups of people. And everybody I know is trying to like nudge into that group and get in the CCS group or the energy transition group because they can see the, the guillotine coming down or the barrier coming down and they kind of want to be on that side rather than the other side. So, yeah, there are opportunity. Um, yeah, there are, yeah. The established players have a potential to, to, to help, whereas they're also going to be arising new players, probably um, delivering some of those things. Um, we have another question from Colin. He says, does the current UK ground investigation industry have the most appropriate methods for obtaining the data required, such as a determination of permeabilities at greater depth? Ooh. Good question. I can, I'll only answer that from the point of view of what I've seen in Jacobs in the last five or six months. You know, companies like Jacobs are very adept at doing things within the first few metres, tens of metres, maybe 100 or a couple of hundred metres, right? So that's their bread and butter. They have very well-developed methods for getting petrophysical data, rock property data, imaging as well, right? Geophysical imaging. I think there's less kind of expertise at going down to the deeper depths that many people on this call or some people on this call um, work with so <laughs> I think there's a lot to learn from industries which have that experience is probably what I'm trying to say so you know like the oil and gas industry so Slumberge, Fugro there's companies who have done this sort of data acquisition offshore and onshore for the oil and gas industry and they can be and we've worked with some of these companies to look at collecting data for a new problem right so that that's been that's been where we've probably realized our limitation at doing primary ground investigations because we're not used to doing ground investigations at this depth in these geology these geologies so yeah there's going to be more usage of what we call supply chains right where there's a number of in you know um companies together who are trying to uh, provide a solution to a, a problem <clears throat> There's one thing I noticed actually in the graph where you talked about the students um, not having or starting to have an interest in the sustainable geoscience versus what companies 
are expecting um, from geoscientists in the, in the sense that they're not expecting to have a lot of geoscientists working towards net zero. It's quite disappointing that we've got people that want to actively do something, but then the established companies think they, they won't have a use for geoscientists. Yeah, I mean, but having said that, you know, we had an advisory board at Imperial College that came in every year to guide us around the curriculum development, and they were very good. And they were all, and I'll be honest, they were already having conversations about the types of geoscientists they needed before we'd sort of really thought about it. Mm. So, you know, they wanted more digital geoscientists, as they sort of are sometimes referred to now. They wanted people who were more numerate, and that's why we've grown a bunch of new master's courses, which are more kind of um, machine learning focused. Um, and then, you know, some courses have closed down, of course. So, yeah, I think they were well aware that there, there, there was this thing coming and they needed a slightly different flavour of geoscientists to, to help them with that because they could still do the old oil and gas stuff, but they could also mm-hmm. be prepared for what was coming in the future. And I, I think it's very exciting. I can see why people are nervous about it from an employment point of view, but it is, you know, it's a very... Um, I think geology is just amazing. Obviously, hopefully that's come across. And I just think, you know, no matter what somebody tells me every morning to go and look at, I'll be excited by it. And I think we should try and communicate that to our peers and young people. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, Any more questions for Chris? Uh, Don't think there are any. there's, There's one that's just come up from Raphael. Uh, regarding education, uh, yeah, so this is something I talked about today and I'm talking about tomorrow at a meeting in Jacobs is about the overlap between effectively geology and geography. So, you know, when we're talking about geology in the physical earth, the interaction with the atmosphere, the lithosphere atmosphere interactions, the oceans as well, there's the people and having and making sure that we educate um geologists about the people and and energy provision and resources and you know and and like when I did that I don't I did economic geology in my third year but I don't remember being shown a graph about energy consumption at all right or anything which kind of contextualized the geology which I was learning about mineral resources in that in that case so I do think there's a really exciting chance to make you know the way we're educating people more about the people (laughs) So that so that we create much more well-rounded geoscientists. So we 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 talk about that. And you know, we've done that in the last few years. You know, there's like decolonizing geology courses, right? There's part of the curriculum mm-hmm. where we're talking about the historical legacy or the colonial legacy of geology, why that's problematic, what it's led to. So people come out of it not just being good at pushing buttons and making maps, they also come out of it with a much better and broader awareness of the context in which they're going to be applying their science and I, I find that hugely inspiring and as a kind of as a citizen that that's happening it is it is yeah um I think that's probably it mm-hmm. questions lots of thank yous of course all right thank you all right um if you can unmute, unmute, please, and give Chris a round of applause for a very, very thought-provoking and interesting lecture today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. It's like being in the room. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> That's the aim. That's you the know, aim. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't get like a pint afterwards, though, or a, a you know, like that. I'll just go and drink in the hotel. I'll go and drink in the hotel bar on my own. Mm. I'm not, I'm not proud. <laughs> next time we'll have to invite you to the offices next time and then you can get a plan. <laughs> thank you very much no, thank you very much chris um before uh, you leave um we have next month a let me just share my screen so next month on the 23rd of november we've got the early careers geologist competition um, if you know of any young geologists or early career geologists with under 10 years uh, experience postgraduate that would like to take part and they leave or work in the Thames Valley region, please encourage them to take part. The first, uh, if, if they win, then they get a, um, a Geological Society special publication of their choice, plus £100 cash. 
and uh, second place you get 50 pounds and then also for the winner you have an opportunity to participate in the geological society national final which will be held early 2023 it'll be good to get uh, more applicants uh, this year like we we had uh, was it uh, late last year november so yeah please um also um, we're still looking for a treasurer, so if you're interested in joining the committee, uh, get in touch with myself or Vicky, uh, or if you just want um, just, to, just to be in the committee without any role, just get in touch as well. Yeah, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Uh, have, the, have a good uh, rest of your evening and see you next month. Thank you.